Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Green. I'm a producer and the founder of Dear Producer, which is an educational platform I launched in 2018 to help bring the producing community together and educate filmmakers on the state of the business as it relates to independent film. You can subscribe to the newsletter through dearproducer.com and also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Dear Producer. All of the content on Dear Producer is free, which has been made possible through my sponsors, Genuine Article Pictures, CineReach, the Creative Producer Residency at the Nevada City Film Festival, and the Media Farm. And with that, we're going to jump right into our conversation. Where do we go from here? Um, I will say that we are recording this conversation on February 5th, so it's quite possible that everything changes by the time this panel is released to the public in March. Um, but we'll dive in and talk about where things are at this particular moment in time. And so to start, I just want to have our, welcome our speakers and also just give them a moment to introduce themselves to you. So Manette, I'll start with you. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Manette Louie. I'm an independent film producer based in New York City. Film and television, I should say, now. Um, my latest credits mm. are uh, Swallow, which was released the last normal weekend during the pandemic, but right before the pandemic. Um, and I Carry You With Me, which has been, uh, is will be released May 2021 after having a release date postponed six times. <laughs> Asher? Oh, hi, my name is Asher Goldstein, um, also an independent producer. Uh, my last credit was a film called Just Mercy that we released uh, with Warner Brothers at the beginning of 2020 and then had sort of an interesting re-release over the summer uh, of 2020 as well. Um, years ago now, I had the launch of, of kind of my, my baby uh, film called Short Term 12 at South by Southwest. So anything related to South by is very special to me. Uh, but my, my experience is, is both as a producer, but um, having needed to have a job, I got to learn a lot um, working in sales and distribution acquisitions uh, and development and production as, a, as an executive as well. So I kind of have a, a few different sides of experience uh, to maybe bring to the table. Great. April? Hi, my name is April Speaks. I'm an independent producer uh, based in LA. <laughs> and my most recent film is a film called African America, which will premiere soon <laughs> this year <laughs> um and uh let's see i had a film called gin that premiered here at south by southwest uh it won the grand jury prize for writing and um was distributed by mgm and um yeah i'm excited my background is in uh, uh producing and directing as well so great so to start the conversation, I want to kind of have a big, you know, big picture view. You know, we're now one year into the pandemic um, with, I think, another year kind of in front of us. Um, and I, I want to know from you guys, when it comes to our industry, what have we learned in this past year and what changes do you want to see happen in 2021? Let's start with April. <laughs> you know it's interesting um i you know when we started out with this pandemic i was very optimistic i was very like this is a new era this is a new time for indie film and independent film and you know this is our chance to 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 redesign you know rethink the system and just do it over and um you know Fast forward to a year later, <laughs> I don't know that I still feel that same optimism. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, I mean, as a producer, as a filmmaker, I've definitely learned a lot, um, particularly when it comes to audiences. I, uh, you know, I, I released the film during the pandemic last year, toward the end of last year. And, you know, it was a film that we had, we had initially <clears throat> set out to kind of go our own path with distributing it and then kind of felt like, you know, like self-distribution and felt like this is a great time because everybody's at home sitting on their couch and like this can be part of that wave of, you know, really researching and kind of seeing like how to go about, like maybe this is another way of distributing films and, and, and maybe this is like another path for those, you know, indie films and 
it just didn't happen that way. And it's like the, in many ways, the system is still the system, even when we're sitting on our couches. And so um, it's, just, it's just proven to be um, really difficult and, and even more so because of the circumstances that we're in because of the pandemic. Um, you know, I also, I mean, you know, when everybody was putting up black school, you know, in terms of inclusion and diversity and that kind of thing, when everybody's putting, you know, I never really saw that as like, now's our chance. <laughs> Because I'm like, people put up squares and they can say things and it can be lip service. What's really going to happen? Um, but I'll say like, even in that regard, you know, the, I, I would love to see more happening in terms of opportunities and in terms of diversity. Um, you know, you've seen little strides here and there, but, um, you know, in terms of what changes I would love to see happen in 2021, I would love for this this you know, season that we're in to kind of open up more doors of opportunity for people of color, creators of color to, um, you know, have bigger deals happen and to see, you know, more work get out there on a larger scale, um, really on any scale, because at this point, I feel like, you know, even on a small scale, it's difficult to get a, a film up off the ground. And I mean, I think that's always been the case, but I feel like it's even more so now. So in terms of, um, you know, what we learned, um, I don't know, I feel like a lot of the, we, I, I, feel like, I feel like we spent a lot of the pandemic going, well, when things get better, <laughs> we're just gonna wait it out. Like it's gonna get better. And I think we've all just been waiting for it to get better, but I don't think any of us really thought that we would be here a year later. And so, now it's kind of like well, yeah and when you and I were speaking the other night you said well now everyone yeah, at the beginning we were kind of you know gung-ho let's make change but now that we're close to a vaccine everyone's just sitting now waiting for the vaccine and so mm -hmm. like don't worry about innovation and changes like we're almost there and we can go back to the way things were it's like kind of what mm -hmm. I feel right now yeah. in this moment yeah yeah I feel like, it's like a, yeah go ahead I actually think that there has been innovation I mean like the like the virtual cinema thing, you know, um, it was it was basically done as a as a necessity, really, because the theaters couldn't sell tickets. And I do think, you know, some portion of it is like here to stay. Um, I think that, um, you know, I was on another panel speaking to Wendy Lydell of Kino Lorber, who launched Kino Marquee. Um, and she was saying that like, you know, theaters now have gotten a taste of digital revenue and she would rather like um, give a give a piece of that revenue to mom and pop art house theaters than to, you know, iTunes and Amazon corporate entities. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a way to, uh, to learn from that and to take that into the post pandemic era. Um, but I will say that it has been, I think, harder for independent films. Um, because frankly, we just have less, like less actual space to promote our movies. Like literally we, it's just screens right now. You know, we're not out in the world. We don't have any physical theater screens. We have no film festivals. There's no like real estate. There's no space to promote our movies. And like, basically we're competing for screen real estate and we're competing with things like Wonder Woman 84 and, you know, really huge blockbusters. Um, and, you know, like when I turn on my Amazon Fire TV, there's like a, you know, a, an Amazon movie plastered right in front. You know, it's really hard to compete with that if you're a small movie with no stars. Well, yeah, and we talked the last time you and I spoke on a panel, I was bringing up the, you know, just Instagram numbers and like Netflix has 26 million followers. Sony Classics who released in your movie has 35,000. So it's like, how, how do you compete with people? Cause that is how they're finding movies right now at home. Like you're saying without these other outlets and it's like, you just can't even compete in that space. And yeah, Asher. Yeah, look, I, I, um, I think that in, a, in an interesting way, the sort of industry at large, the kind of, I guess, I don't know how you want to say it, but more establishment sort of or studio side or whatever it is uh, however you want to describe it, has sort of gotten the taste that we've all had of what we've all had for the last 10 years, which is um, because of the consolidation that's happened, because there's fewer places that are making things, um, it's become harder and harder to get things made. And because there's not a clarity of where, um, where a project's going to land in terms of its exhibition platform now, uh, there's, I think, there's, there, there just, there feels like there's been a bottleneck in terms of how you how you can find a home for something. 
I think, I think in terms of what the year showed, I guess the two things I'll, I'll say, and the, and the second one's more important, really. The first one is, I do think that there was something, as much as I want to, I want to save the cinema experience. I want to save going into a theater. I want my movies in, in movie theaters. Like I, I want that, but I do think that this year in terms of seeing what has become um, interesting to audiences, I do think that there's some relevance for us as the people who are like cinema purists to understand that maybe people at home are gonna be a little bit more willing to digest something that they might not have seen in a theater. And I feel like there, there is some opportunity there as independent filmmakers uh, so far as we could figure out a way to create that screening platform to, to Manette's point. But I, I do, I do think that um, with all this consolidation, with this drive towards streaming in, in, in such a way at, at the studio level, I do think that, you know, perhaps we might not get as many independent films made, but we could get independent, independent type films made, right. Artist driven films made at, at a larger level because of the fact that, uh, costs will have to go down because audiences are more interested in provocative, more provocative material, I think, I hope. Um, I think the other part of it that I would like to see change, uh, I just want to echo what Averill said, like, we've, we, we had a lot of big, like, idealistic, like, statements come out this year, and so let's do it, you know, like, let's, let's put all that stuff into practice, let's put, uh, let's be really vocal about making sure that we're being specific about point of view and who's telling stories and who we're empowering to tell stories. Like let's like, that's, that was, that's probably the first thing on my mind because I, I don't know if anything has really changed in our system in terms of availability of fi financing, et cetera. It's, it's gotten less, but the big question mark is, you know, whose stories are we telling and how are we going to get those stories out there? Because we talked a lot about it this year and let's, let's actually make some, make some changes. And, and put it, put all that idealism into practice. When I would say, we always say, whose story are we telling? And I think we should start saying, whose stories are we financing? Because that's really yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. down there you to, go. right? It's like, you can give them the fellowship in the lab and you know all, right. all these things that are, are put out on the platter. But at the end of the day, like during 2020, the projects you saw get pushed through you know, the pandemic we're all A-list stars, you know, particularly not people of color or women. And, and so it's really about where's the money coming from. And like April saying, like, forget the black square. It's like <laughs> pony up the cash, you know, and that's really what right. makes the difference. Yeah. Um, Manette, is there just to add to what you were saying, is there anything that you would like to see happen this year in particular? Other uh, than your movie finally coming out? Oh my God, please. No, that's really it. If that happens, I will be so happy. It's been, you know, premiered a year ago at Sundance. <laughs> um, what else would I like to see? I mean, you know, I kind of want to add to that. It's not just about uh, whose movies are getting financed or whose stories are being financed, but whose stories are being promoted. Yeah. You know, there. If you look at like all the, I'm in this awards season right now, and like, you know, my movie has has brown guys in it. It's a Spanish language movie with Mexican gay guys, and. Um, you know, the level of promotion, it may not be as much as, you know, a, another movie with, with white actors. And so it's, uh, it, it's been challenging. And, 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 and I just see like, you know, getting these award screeners, like what a difference there is in like how much money Netflix and Amazon can spend on a campaign. Um, so there's a, it's, there's a definite, you know, I think awards are, awards were supposed to be created. They were created to sort of like um, get away from just looking at box office as a measure of the success of a film, you know, because you're actually supposed to uh, uh, give awards based on the quality of the movies, but it's really become another capitalistic av avenue, you know, it's like mm -hmm. spend the most marketing dollars. So it's really important to, uh, you know, promote films, you know, buying about people of color by POC and, and women. Um, so I'd like to see more of that this year, <laughs> for sure. But it's going to be challenging because I think that you know, I think a lot of art house theaters may not come back. Um, who knows what's even going to happen to the big chains at this point. Um, and there's just so many movies that are like backlogged, like big studio features that are going to compete for screen space this year. So I am worried about like all the movies coming out at Sundance and, and South by and the movies that were supposed to come out last year. It's just going to be, I think, uh, 
a little crazy. So I do think that the experimentation and the innovation in release patterns and shrinking of windows is going to continue uh, for at least an, another year. But I'm going to dig into this question to kind of like another another level because I think when I typically when I ask people about the the theatrical experience, which is really important to to these smaller indie films, the answer is always just well, I people I believe people are going to come back to the theaters. Like that's kind of where everyone lands, and so I just want to push that conversation a little bit because um, I don't think it's that simple. And so there was an IndieWire article published a few weeks ago that asked the question, when theaters fully reopen after the COVID-19 vaccine is rolled out and the pandemic ends, how can art house films survive when there are similar films with A-list stars on streamers available to audiences at home? And so the reporter interviewed several people you know, the, the CEO of Landmark believes that theaters will rebound completely, but that the smaller and mid-sized movies are definitely going to be left out because they don't have that spectacle. Ted Hope thinks that theaters should be integrated into places where you can accomplish more, like being attached to malls or grocery stores so you can order your food while you're watching your movie. Um, and and the, the harder one to read was Tabitha Jackson, who's the director of Sundance Film Festival. And she said that losing the theatrical component, quote, would be a great cultural loss, but we, we being Sundance, don't really have our hooks into the theatrical distribution system. So it's not for us to solve this particular conundrum, which to me just reads like, not my problem, right? And so, so whose problem is it, right? Like, I think that, you know, how do art house films, like how, like, you know, looking at a film like Minari or I think Nomadland might be the exception, you know, Miss Juneteenth, um, Sound of Metal, like how do those kind of films survive um, in theaters when everyone's gotten so used to being at home? Like, do you have thoughts or ideas of like, you know, we're talking about promoting these films and getting them out there. Um, Asher, is there anything like to dig deeper there? I mean, I think, I think it's, Look, if I if I had to solve for it, I would I would uh, have a company <laughs> doing this, you know. But I I think um, I think the question is promotion to some extent. I I, I this is my my like, I, you know, un um, uninformed crystal ball says that I do think that theaters will come back, uh, probably not in the same way they were before. I do think that the world has changed, right? Like there's new normals and all that stuff we hear about, but like. People are going to be stoked to get out of their house. People want to have communal experiences. People are going to go see movies, I think. Um, it might not happen in the same way. I do think, as, as it was before, uh, will, like, you know, you know, a place like the New Art Theater in, in L.A., like a single screen, like, will that, will that be able to sustain? I hope, you know, will stuff like the Draft House, will a place like the Draft House probably still be able to sustain? I, that, I think, is probably more likely I think that just as vinyl now, right, outsells CDs, like I do think that there will be some level of uh, niche interest, but uh, to continue, but I, I, I don't know if it's gonna be, um, if it's gonna be, you know, so widespread that, you know, things are gonna be like they were. I will say that going back to this promotion question is, is something to bring up. Cause I, I'm so curious, I don't know what the numbers are, but I'm so curious what happened with, for instance, Eliza Hittman's movie, uh, that came out earlier this year, which is, is I think really brilliant and is so pure cinema um, and needed to be seen in a theater, but got released in the most weird way where like it got, it was it's opening weekend was when theaters got closed. Uh, and that movie, because of the weird window that it, that it, that it took up, it's, and it's distributor in focus, just kind of throwing out everything they had I feel like social media was popping on, on this movie. I don't know what it did, but I imagine a lot more eyes in a concentrated way saw that movie when it got released than would have if it had a slow rollout. And I, 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 I know the people that made that film, I hope people see it in theater someday. Um, but I do think that there's something in that, in that promotion question of if you make it available and you can get people's attention to it, you will get eyes on it. Um, and I think that's where most independent film will go uh, at the end of the day. It's going to be streaming. We had a little bit of that. I mean, we were released, Swallow, with Swallow, was, which was released March 6th, I think never rarely, sometimes always was like a week or two after that. Um, we benefited from that, but, uh, you know, be because we had a, this theatrical campaign and then we released Day and Date so that when everyone shut down, like we were the, one of the few new movies available on VOD. So we did well, but I think that's just like a, you know, 
a one-off, it's an anomaly. Um, and uh, it would be great if we could continue to do that. But I just think it's, you know, I think even with Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, that was, it was kind of a one-off for, for them too, because there weren't a lot of movies around at that time. Um, but yeah, but it's about building events around these, li these little movies. It's about getting them the promotion you know, uh, because there were there was no competition for for press ink. You know, uh, Swallow and and Eliza's movie was able to get more of that. So um, yeah, we need more people to dedicate to write writing our, our about our movies, basically. When April, you and I spoke, and you were saying when I was asking, kind of like, what did we learn? And you were saying, you know, H or sorry, Warner Brothers spent the entire year thinking about how to get to audiences. What's the best way to get their movies? And for them, it was HBO Max, and like when does Indy stop and really think about how do we get to the masses of audiences and, and not as like one-offs, not this one festival or this one distributor, like we're so piecemealed out as a, as a community. And so do you have like, do you have more thoughts on like, how do we get to audiences? Well, like, you know, I, I think for me, what Asher said and what Manette said, like they're very closely related. Like, I agree. I think that, you know, people are going to go back to are going to go back to the theater but I think it's going to look differently than it did before and it's going to be more an event more of an event in terms of indie filmmakers and how we make that event it comes back to publicity and it comes to expanding that window of what we consider to be valid I think a lot of times when we talk about diversity and we talk about like you know you know in inclusion of women of people of color or what have you a lot of times we talk about like the story and yes, that is the thing, but it's also, you know, you, we also have to kind of expand where we're looking for content <laughs> and, you know, um, and what kind, what uh, outlets we consider valuable and consider, um, you know, prestigious enough to, to, like I said, to consider valuable. And I think there's, there's other film festivals where there's, you know, people of color are premiering their films that are great films that are, that are beyond kind of the five that are, that are considered to be the, the go-to. Sometimes we have to kind of look, look under the rocks <laughs> for, for the hidden talent. Um, I think there's other publications that, that are, you know, other critics out there. There are other writers that we could be looking at and, and getting kind of our, just kind of broadening our sensibility about how we're receiving content and how we're getting content. I think all of it is connected. You know, I'm seeing that now, even with our film, African America, as we're trying to find a publicist, you know, where we've been looking for a publicist to cover our film. And it's like, because we're not at, you know, this festival, that festival, this is actually, we talk about this all the time that like Sundance is not the only festival for your film, but it's like trying to get a publicist or get someone to cover a different film so that your film can get that exposure you know, that can be a challenge sometimes too. So I feel like, you know, it's all connected. I think that, um, I, I think Manette hit it on the head in terms of like, you know, getting the word out and that that publicity is, is a big key to that. Um, so when it comes to, you know, different voices and everything, I, I think it has to go a step further beyond just getting diverse stories. Like we also have to look in other places where we're not used to looking for that talent and for those stories as well. And like, we can't, we can't have to make space for that. Well, um, you, you talked a lot about with Jin that, you know, it's all those, yes to all the things you're saying, but it's also that we have a system of distributors who have set what the 10 key markets are and that's what they go. And it's like, your mm -hmm. film may not be for those particular cities. And in turn, you're missing out on potential revenue from other mm -hmm. places because an old school system has decided it's Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Philly, whatever. I don't even know the top 10 off my head. But like, mm -hmm. that's another big part of the problem is again, we're not going to where the audiences are. We're expecting mm -hmm. them to find us. And I think that's a big disconnect um, mm -hmm. in, in film in general, studio and indie. Well, Definitely. I'm happy to report that Sony Classics is really good. Uh, uh, well, hopefully they will be when the, when they open my movie. <laughs> I, I, carry, I carry you with me. Well, you know, we talked. We hired. They hired a Latinx publicist specifically to to um, you know deal with those markets and publications, um, and and also like we're planning to open um, first in New York and LA on May 21st, but then the following weekend we're going to expand to about 10 cities that have high concentrations of Spanish speakers, you know, in Arizona, Texas, and Florida, um, and California. So, you know, they're looking at those, 
not the top 10 cities, but the cities with the highest concentrations of, of Latino folks. And I, you know, that's smart. And I think that if you, you're lucky enough to work with the distributor, you know, distributors think about that, uh, the smart ones do, so. Yeah. I, and I think, I think this whole push of, um, sorry, was someone gonna say something? I don't wanna talk over you. Uh, no, I, 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 do, I do agree. I think that there have been some, you know, I mean, as a viewer, like as someone who's sitting at home scrolling through Facebook and through Instagram, like I feel like there's been some some interesting, um, you know, rollouts. Like, you know, Miss Juneteenth, for example, vertical. I think I was talking to someone about this just a few weeks ago. Like, you know, it seems I don't know what their numbers are, but it seems like you know they had a good awards campaign. I mean that you know, advertisements were everywhere about that film. So I think that they, you know, have done an interesting job with working with the filmmakers to kind of find that audience for that film. Um, you know, I know another film that that uh, premiered last year at South by Southwest, I'll Meet You, I think it's called I'll Meet You There by Erin Bilal, is having its premiere now through Level Forward. And they're doing some really interesting things with its impact campaign. And I'm interested to see how that's gonna, how that's gonna pan out in terms of, you know, in terms of numbers, but also in terms of impact, in terms of moving forward with independent film and kind of, you know, stepping outside of the box a little bit and, um, and looking at different ways to innovate and to find that specific audience that, that will, you know, connect with a particular film, especially for films that are, you know, a little more niche or, or um, you, know, you know, in that, in, in a particular, Room, I guess. Um, so I'm interested to see what happens with those. So I do think that there are, some, you know, sort of these examples of of um, of distributors that are going a different route. But it, that's like I just think three, <laughs> you know. And I I hope that it, it becomes more. And I hope that that becomes the the opportunity in this in this time that we're in is that more people start to think along those lines. Asher. Yeah, I I I, I was just I was just gonna want to add that you know I think. It's funny because you get a bunch of producers together and we'll tell you what's wrong with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good um, at that. <laughs> yeah, it's our, our jobs are to know a little bit about everything, right? Um, yeah. Our jobs are to be a bit Swiss Army nice about stuff. But I, I think that some of, these, some of the push that I've seen um, to diversify the critics class is something that's really important that, that ties with, with having a good publicist. I feel like, you know, I, I definitely saw this um, I've seen this on, on movies I've worked on. I saw this on, on our last film uh, that there was a noticeable difference when, especially when you have culturally specifically told stories and you have someone writing about those stories without understanding some of the shorthand in those stories, you're gonna miss parts of the movie. You're gonna miss part of the things to celebrate. And I think that that's, that's really important. And I think on the other side of it, I just feel like, I don't know, I, I mean, this isn't something that we can all do, but I, just to say it out loud, like, I feel like a lot of um, the people in our community that are, that are the journalists, that are the critics, like, there's a real negative tone that I hear a lot of the time, you know, and like, like, the, their top 10 worst performances or like lists like that. I like, it's like, I don't need that. I don't want it that, you know what I mean? Like, there's enough time and there's too many movies that don't get celebrated that need to be celebrated. I want indie wires every. I, I would like indie wires their every review to be movies that we should pay attention to, and I feel like if if we all we're all dependent on independent film or or film at large surviving, the people writing about the movies need those movies to survive as well. And I and I really feel like I'm not saying that people shouldn't be good journalists and speak truth, but bashing a little movie that got made at Sundance or, or got premiered at Sundance versus promoting one that got made at Sundance isn't speaking truth to power. It's getting mm -hmm. clicks. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's not helping the overall family here. Um, anyways, just to- I never thought about that. that someone Bruce, else Bruce. I was actually <laughs> just talking to one of my filmmakers about that the other day because we were, I, I, I'm forgetting which movie it was. She, she was like really rattled up because she's like, why is that the story? Um, you know, it was it was a story about like this is terrible, it's like the worst performance ever. And it's like it's really hard to make a movie <laughs> like that. The press that pe that anybody needs like that that you know, especially for indie filmmakers, it's just it's hard enough as it is. And the fact that you have this accomplishment of getting into Sundance or South by or getting a distribution deal or whatever, like can we celebrate that? And can we find something about it to celebrate? Like why is the story? 
this negative thing and, it, and it's like clickbait right and it becomes the thing to like you know to, to, to bash it and you know and then it becomes this whole thread and then there's memes and you guys are so <laughs> nice I, I don't mind negative reviews if they're if they're legit negative reviews I think there's you know criticism is an art and you know, mine, criticism, like criticism is one thing but sometimes these sometimes they're just like oh, it's a personal like, opinion personal yes. yeah without yeah. a real critique yeah that's true yeah, you can tell well, what it's political instead yeah. of artistic. Yes, and we'd probably be better off if we didn't have any of those industry, industry critics, right? And we just engage TikTok influencers to watch our movies. Like, I feel like TikTok, kids on TikTok should be treated as critics. They should be able to see our movies, talk about our movies, put like they should get their early screenings. Like they should be on the list when we're showing our films to critics. Like I've just, I've been working, I've been talking to Brian Newman and like, he's like introduced me to like all the film, film Twitter, film TikTok. And it's like, I just looked up at follows. So I was like, holy shit. Like, I didn't know all this stuff was here. Right. Yeah. And, yet, and yet we're still sure. kind of not in that space, but um, it's quite powerful and quite amazing. But yet, like when we talk about like how we move forward, how is that not our, like how we're three years into TikTok? Like, how is that not a thing yet that that's really what's happening? Um, right. So, okay, so to move a little bit on to just the state of, of the market as it is. So most people know, you know, Coda sold at Sundance for $25 million to Apple. And in response to this, Cassie and Elways, who is, you know, veteran producer, agent, all the things, tweeted saying, this is so positive for the independent film business. People ask me all the time if it's dying. I always say, no, it's very much alive. This proves my point. But to me, you know, one or two big sales out of Sundance does not make a market. You know, as a comparison in 2020, um, 3,800 features were submitted to Sundance. So like, like wow. when you really look at the numbers, one, you know, one movie doesn't move the needle for the community. And so to me, and maybe April, it was you that said that to me the other night, but like what happened to Coda is more like Publishers Clearinghouse showing up at your door with a check for a million dollars, right? Like it's a lottery game. And so- I'm really curious from you guys, you know, I know what Cassian thinks. What do you, what, how would you guys describe the state of the independent market right now? Um, Manette? Abysmal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, Apple and Netflix, you know, paying huge numbers like that doesn't really help the 99% of us out there, the, the 99.9% .9 of us out there making movies. And um, yeah, so I don't think, I disagree with Cassian. I think it's not, you know, you shouldn't use it as an indicator of the health. It's, um, it's great that they got that deal and it's great that there's an appetite for independent film, for sure. You know, it, that the streamers are, are looking for films like ours. Um, but what would be nicer is if like, they would dedicate their resources, their substantive resources to actually financing these films instead of waiting until they're done before they acquire them, because it's like, we have to go, you know, look under couch cushions to find the money to make these little movies. And it's like, why not just give us a decent budget and make them and, and you know, it's- And spend it, less. Like, I don't, I have, I have no idea how much that budget was, but it was not 25 million. And so like, they're also, they also could have taken a much lower risk on that film had they just financed it. Totally, totally. And you know, there are streamers, I've heard streamers say that they're like, you know what, instead, and I think, I hope they're starting to do that. And they're like, instead of buying that movie for 25 million, let's go find, let's go find that script and finance it for 10. You know, um, I think they're doing that more. I hope they do do that more because equity is disappearing. Private equity is disappearing. And, um, you know, we're having to rely more and more as indie producers on these streamers and, and negative pickups from studios to, uh, to make our movies. Avril? Oh, I mean, <laughs> when I said it, I mean, I honestly, I'm, I'm worried. Like I, um, you know, as an independent producer, I, you know, I, um, yeah, I, I'm worried. I, I think that I applaud Coda and the films that sold. And I think that that's great that, you know, that people are watching them, you know, so, you know, to our earlier point, people are watching movies. So I think that that's great. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very difficult to get a film up, you know, as a, on, you know, on the producing side, I'm like, you know, do I need to start looking at television? Like what, you know, what is the, what's the future of, you know, fi for financing in particular for, um, for independent film? 
you know, and it's like, I, I think the thing that, that always kind of, um, you know, I think about is again, going back to my first comment in the beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, I, I would hear people say, you know, um, this is a great time for independent filmmakers. And in, in another six months, like Netflix and Amazon, they're going to be clamoring for content because nobody's making anything. And it's like, that's just not true. And then like, they announced they had, they had 70 movies ready. Yeah. Movies. Yeah. Like, they're, they're doing their thing. I mean, even in the midst of the pandemic, they're shooting things, you know what I mean? And, and for any filmmakers, it's just not the case. Like I, you know, I know, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've been able to, I've been able to create some stuff. I did, you know, I worked on like six projects toward the end of last year, you know, during COVID, but like it's, you know, and those were under very specific circumstances that are not usually the case for independent um, filmmakers. And so it's like, you know, we're just not in a position right now where we're making things right now. Um, and so where does that put us six months from now? Um, yeah, I, and, and like we've been saying, I mean, I think the financing has, has gotten even more difficult. And then you look at the Netflixes and the Amazons and see them constantly coming out with financing, but yet kind of they're at the top of the heap in terms of content right now. And so where does that leave us? Um, and yeah, like I said, Manette hit on the head. It's like, you know how many movies we could have made with <laughs> yeah. that? You know, it's like, that would have been so helpful for us. So uh, yeah, um, I don't, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm worried. I guess that's what I, what I boil it down to. I'm worried about the state of the indie market. Asher? I mean, look, like I, you know, just to sprinkle a little bit of optimism onto the conversation, because we're producers, <laughs> damn it, right? Uh, we never say die. I always um, invite somebody who has some optimism. <laughs> that's me. No, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pragmatic. Look, I, I think, I think just to say the other side of this, um, you know, I'm an independent producer. You know, we're all independent producers. People watching this are, are independent filmmakers. You know that that means that that means we have the ability to to generate things and create things. And what I do think is going to happen, as there is more consolidation, as the agencies are are having some of their power blunted, I think I think potentially the figure that's going to arise as being um, able to take advantage of the fact that there will be a consistent need for stuff after this bottleneck of, of 70 movies at Netflix, it, our producers, you know, we will have an opportunity to make stuff. I think the question is, is what kind of stuff we want to make and who and, and what stories we want to tell or promote or, and all the things we're talking about. But I do think there's going to be an opportunity um, to fill all those slots. And it can't just be the dinosaurs that have been around for a long time. Um, and I think that people that come from the independent side of, of, of things uh, who've had to do all of this stuff, right? Like anyone on this panel knows how to market a movie, distribute a movie, finance a movie, develop a movie, shoot a movie, right? Like everyone could do it all. The fact that you have those skill sets and can walk into a potential setting like a Netflix or an Amazon or a, you know, a, 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 a Disney or whatever it is and actually be a reliable um actual producer is just going to benefit us the folks that i get really concerned about are the people that are behind us because we've got our foot in the door already and so the question for me is how do we and and rebecca you and, and rebecca eminent and Avril, i i don't i don't know Avril that that well but i'm sure i'm sure you're you're about it as well but like the folks on this panel that i that i'm seeing have been really good about peer mentorship and about mentorship about reaching out and i think it's going to be really important for all of us who might not realize it, but we have gotten ahead to, to keep that door open for folks that are younger because they're not going to be having the same opportunity as we did maybe a decade ago when we first started making our movie. Uh, so that those are the people that I'm really concerned about at, at this point. And of course, paying my own rent. But <laughs> um, philosophically speaking, those are the folks. But I, I, like I said, I do think there's an opportunity for us to get some things made, as long as we're willing to play within the system a little bit. And that's the hard part. I, I do wish that like oscilloscope and, and Sony Classics and 
you know, A24 build their own streaming platform and, and band together with Tino Lorb or whatever, whoever else. But until that happens, I think we're, we might be faced with, with facing the big streamers as our, you know, as our uh, I mean, yeah. pocketbooks. I would, I would love if all the indie distributors came together for like one storefront so that you could go to one storefront for all the indie You could still have your own one-offs. You're like, you can have your own space, your own data, your own money, but that, you know, very much like bookshop, which I know there's, there's also criticism for that kind of model. But again, when we're talking about getting to audiences, you know, and consolidating our audiences in ways, I think it's really important. I want to take one quick step back. I'm going to, I'm going to throw this question to you. You know, we've all kind of, you've all kind of thrown out, well, you know, equity is drying up, financing is drying up. You want to just explain why in a, in a, a bite-sized way for people that are watching that don't understand, maybe going to make their first movie, what that means? I'm not, I, I'm not exactly sure why equity is drying up. I think it's just, it's harder to make your money back from you know, uh, I mean, it's always been hard to make to make your money back from an, a film investment. Um, but I just think now, uh, well, it's harder because a lot of the streamers are creating their own content. Um, they're not necessarily looking for uh, independently produced content unless it's like, you know, the tip of the top like Coda. Um, so that's probably part of it. And I don't know, I just feel like, you know, throughout the years, more and more, just more and more financiers are, are, are they're, they're getting more risk averse and, and like they'd rather debt finance than equity finance. Um, obviously there's always new players coming in. There's new people, there's new equity players, but it's kind of like, you know, they'll equity finance for a year and then try to try to, they do it to, to, to be producers basically, you know, and then they stop financing after a while and call themselves producers after that. What, what, we, what we need to do is we need to, uh, is we need to convince, um, the streamers that it's a good thing to get into early business with young producers and directors. Uh -huh. And yeah. I think, I think that, I think that's what we need. We need to incept them, yeah. but it is true, right? Like if I was a streamer, like why, how could I look at the resume of any of the people that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at on my screen right now and be like, these are folks that can't get shit done. Like, like all of you are people that have made great work consistently. Like why are, you know, why aren't, why, why is it Netflix saying, or, or Amazon or any of these folks being like, you're a reliable player. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going to you. You know, I, I feel like that's, that's a big question. Cause a lot of the, a lot of the thing that comes up in a lot of these producer panels is like, you're, you made a movie, it got attention, your director went off like to do something else. What do you do? And mm -hmm. I, and I feel like I, I, I really, I really, uh, I really hope we could change that culturally in the executive class in terms of how they how they look at us and our value, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's true. It's very much about moving the director forward. I can say no streamers called me up and after it follows, nobody called me up. It's like, you think that movie just kind of came out of thin air? You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't happen. You're right. And it's like, it's about getting out the value of what we do. And also they, you know, they want to be changing their ranks of directors with more, you know, uh, singular voices, I think is how they say it, right? And like more diversity and more women and more people of color. It's like, we're the ones kind of nurturing, finding those voices and bringing them to the surface. And so, absolutely. Um, I, will say, I will say that I, I, I have noticed in the last couple of years, two years, let's say, um, that they are, I, I've been getting a lot more calls uh, for like a creative producing jobs for hire. I just did one actually right before the pandemic uh, for Amazon and Blumhouse where I was like, the creative producer hired to like partner with the director and like you know shepherd him through his first feature um and i had a great time i, I really got on with my director and my actors and um I did, it was great i didn't have to worry about budget and, and, and any of that stuff and you know i've met with um some some tv studios who are like you know everybody's like all this everybody needs content and they're putting out so much content that like they don't have enough um bandwidth within their own executives to develop everything. So they are looking to bring on outside producers to help writers develop and, you know, being on set to, to hold the director's hand and stuff like that. I think, I think it's, it's happening, but like Asher said, like, thankfully, like, like I'm already established, you know, um, even though, even though I still have to jump through hoops and convince Netflix and Amazon that I'm hireable. I mean, it is, it is, I've had to, I had to jump through hoops to get that to get the uh, oh, the check mark from from Amazon, um, and so, uh, but it is it's important to for the younger producers coming up. Um, but I, I yeah, it's interesting. I, I do think that there is a is a there is a barrier there, uh, a racial and and a gender barrier there for sure that I've faced. 
Well, and that kind of tees up as we're slowly, quickly already running out of time that my last question for you guys, you know, so through Dear Producer, you know, I commissioned a producer sustainability survey, which I published the report um, on Monday and it was um, completed by over 470 producers. Um, and the average was someone who's made six to 15 movies. The average age was 43. So these weren't kind of like fresh out of film school producers who filled it out. And, you know, the kind of most staggering um, statistic is that in 2019, 41% of respondents of producers earned $25,000 or less from producing work. And in 2020, that income dropped. So it was 56% of respondents earned 25,000 or less. And so, you know, kind of talking about this new generation, Asher, you know, was talking about if you were in film school right now or early in your career, you know, would you go down the same path of like, I just want to make a film with my friends from film school and get started and make that little movie? Mm -hmm. you know, would you think about it? Like, I personally went into the studio system first and I worked in acquisitions and development. And like, so what would you advise an indie filmmaker right now, early in their career, to be thinking about, you know, also? Minette, when we talked about sustainability on my last panel, Derek quickly pivoted to TV. It's like, I don't know that we can just do indie. So, um, Avril, I want to start with you. You know, what would you tell someone just starting out right now? Um, I think I would tell someone to, I, I, I often feel like kind of one of the, one of the big sort of, um, gaps in producing is the business side of it and it, it's like this is a business like you're running a small business like um you know if and i say this as someone who i didn't say this in my intro but i used to be a professor so i, I spent 10 years as a college professor teaching film and you know i would always be on the fence like when people would be like should i go to film school i'd be like mm. <laughs> um you know so it, you know kind of giving that advice i'm like you know, maybe it, maybe hold on to your film film love and go get an MBA or get like a marketing degree or something because I just feel like, you know, those two areas like finance finance slash budgeting running running a business, as well as marketing are like the business side of 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 producing and and um, filmmaking that. Um, is often not taught in school. And again, I say this as a former professor, <laughs> um, it's just not often taught. And I think that that's uh, something that anyone coming into this business needs to understand and realize and, and figure out how to um, get around it. I would hope, I think that, you know, we were, we were talking a lot about um, like the hope for the future and what do we want to see in the future, things like that. I would hope that, you know, the younger generation can find, figure out a way to like fix this system because the system is, is very broken. And I would hope that they could, you know, figure something or find a way to kind of like beat the system in some way. Um, but I think that comes from getting out there, doing it, producing movies. Um, but it also comes from like having a little bit of business sense and whether that comes from, from school, like in a classroom or whether it comes from just like, you know, getting out there and doing it, it is a big part of the job. So that would be my, um, my thing. Is I, my, my I, I will say that, you know, like even having that business knowledge, which I did have, I was in corporate marketing and whatever business development before I, I entered producing. It doesn't help you make money as a producer. <laughs> no. and, and and frankly, like forget the people starting out. Like I was really lucky this year to get a first look deal with Topic, my first ever in my 13 year for 13 year producing career. And if we hadn't gotten that deal, which provides some a little bit of overhead to kind of sustain us, I haven't shot a movie in a year, you know, and I don't know when I'm going to shoot my next movie and I don't make money unless I'm in production. Nobody pays for development. Even TV, big TV streamers don't pay when you're developing series, you know, you're expected to work for free in development all the time. So like, if it weren't for that deal, I would be in a lot of financial trouble right now. And it's, it's a problem. It's a systemic problem. It's not something that like is going to be solved by, you know, Oh, just go out there and make your movie and whatever. Um, it, it, I think, you know, 
I think that we need to do something about about like collective action with producers, for example, or or look at the European and Canadian system where there is like um, soft money from the government and um, a portion of every production budget goes toward overhead. So there there needs to be sort of big policy changes in order to really change the whole independent producer sustainability issue. Asher. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't know the I don't know the right answer, you know, um, I, I, I'd say, you know, looking at my path and like path of friends, which, which, which was a little bit different because, you know, like you, Rebecca, like I, um, I went to, I went to film school at NYU. Um, I just paid it off like months ago. Um, took Congrats. a long time. <laughs> Big deal. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. thanks. Uh, and they immediately called me for donations. No. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, you know, I, I got out of school and, and honestly, like I'm sitting here with you all. So I can't, I can't complain about my path. Right. Um, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had six figures of debt if I had done it over again. You know what I mean? And I don't know if I would have been as been, 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 you know, as, as wanted to sit on a panel or not, but like it would have made my life probably easier. I, what I wouldn't change is doing what I did and what you did, which was, um, April, to your point, I got into the business. I knew, I remember PAing my first day, PAing out of film school. I was on the movie of the week and I was sweeping an airplane hanger because they had shot there. And I was like, this is not going to, I want to, I knew what I wanted to do. And I think that, you know, when you first start out, you know, and you're not quite sure, like PAing, being assistant, intern, all that stuff, if you have the barrier for entry covered, because that's, that, I think that's a big, that's a big problem to solve, frankly, um, especially when we talk about, words like inclusion and diversity is getting people into the system and making sure that they know that it's available to them, I think is, I think is a big thing. But what I, what I did was I found work as close to what was interesting to me as possible until I was able to find a job that would pay me to make, to, to be close to making something. In, in my case, that job was a little startup company that was owned by a law firm. And I made no more than 40 grand the entire a year the entire like almost seven years that I worked there um with an executive title but I got to produce and I was stoked about that and that was always my game was whether it was that whether it was when I, I worked at Broad Green as an executive I, I which was another startup of sorts I always was looking for a job that was going to get me close to making stuff and in that process I ended up working as a sales agent, which I never wanted, thought I would want to do, or a packaging executive, all this stuff. But now, like, as we were talking about before, like, I know how to put together a movie. I know how to sell a movie. I know how to be, a, I know enough to be dangerous when I'm sitting with marketing execs. And that includes at a studio or distribution exec at a studio, or if I'm talking to an indie distributor or someone that's doing a service release, right? Uh, like, and so I, I, I think that, I think that, um, being getting myself into the industry itself and learning the way that it works and making relationships with people that are now agents and managers, et cetera, was super vital for me. Um, but likewise, I think the number one advice that I give anyone who asks this question, then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up, which is the same thing I've always said is you've got to just fucking make something. Sorry if I'm not this curse, but you have to make something, whether it's for $500 or $25,000 or $150,000 or a million dollars, you got to make something because no one's looking at you and saying, you know what, you should have opportunity. You got to make your opportunity. That's, that's the, that's the number one thing. Cause even if you like go up the executive ranks, becoming a producer from being a development executive is so hard. You probably have to do it yourself. So the reason why I'm sitting here and I get to say like, I'm, I'm working on, on, on projects at, 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 at a studio level in some cases and an independent level in others. But the reason why I'm able to do that is because I built those relationships because I got myself into the business and as much as I wanted to just be creative. So that's my diatribe, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and I'll, <laughs> I'll piggyback off that to wrap that up. I mean, when I graduated film school, I didn't know how to raise money. I didn't have a script I wanted to make. I had no idea how you even got started. I didn't have money. And so I got a job out of necessity. But what I learned is that you know, in order to figure out how you get through the system, you have to learn how to, the system works. And you could go make the most amazing movie with your friends for a hundred grand. But if you don't know who to show it to, where to get it to, like it, it sits. And I'm sure there's amazing movies out there that never made it our, to our screens because they didn't know how to be discovered. Like discovery is a weird word. Like you don't usually just get plucked 
out of a system that happens just a very few times a year. So that is, that is also my advice too. Um, that is all the time we have for today. <laughs> I could talk to you guys a lot longer, but um, you know, to those watching, there is a ton of more content like this on dearproducer.com. We did webinars all last year. There's interviews, there's resources. Um, again, it's all free. So please go and, and read and share. And just, I wanna thank you guys so much for having this conversation and being very candid and, and open. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.